together. Amen? Amen. Well, without any um, further ado, we have guests from all around the world. They are coming from um, five different nations in the sense of where they're from, but many of them coming, I think, even from different locations, even to come up here together to be here. Um, but the apostles of the ministry are going to to introduce the rest of their team as they come up. So I just want to inter- introduce, I'll just introduce Craig and Colette Toach as they come up. Will you honor them as they come up? Thank you so much, you guys. As promised, uh, for those of you in the first session, we're going to have a, a little bit of fun this time round. Here we're going to have more fun. I already feel at home, so forgive me if I get too comfortable up here. If she takes her shoes off, we know it, folks. Actually, <laughs> he was already following me. <laughs> All right, so in our first session, we laid out the importance of the fivefold ministry, not just because of the job that we do, that because in the fivefold, Jesus Christ expresses his full heart. Each of the fivefold ministry has been gifted with one aspect of the Father's heart, because no one man could fully express Christ in his fullness. And so we went to the, the passage of Ephesians 4, 11, 12, and 13, where I spoke about how Jesus gave to the church the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and I broke it down to five simple functions. Now, all of the fivefold ministry are meant to fulfill these five functions in the church, but how they fulfill it is what defines them. And what defines an apostle or a prophet or a teacher isn't the gifts that they function in. Do you know that all five can prophesy? All five can do deliverance. All five can teach. All five can even heal the brokenhearted. But how they perform these acts differs according to to their dispensation of grace. And so as we threw this message around, I thought there was no better way to do it than to put five of us up here on stage to lay out the five functions of the fivefold ministry. I went totally all out on this one. So please, I'm going to invite three of my team up here today. I'm going to start with Michael Feltazen. <laughs> Michael is the co-principal of our prophetic school with his lovely wife, Deborah Ann Danae, my firstborn. So this would make him my first son-in-law. And uh, my daughter married a man just like his mother. We get on famously. <laughs> we bring the fire. Say hello, Michael. Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Michael, as you all know. <laughs> all right, then I'm going to bring up my second eldest. This would be Jessica. She is my second born. She and her husband, Austin, they are the pastors of our five-fold ministry campus. And uh, she looks sweet, but her sword is sharp. She will offend you. She's my daughter after all. <laughs> yep. Last, and I left the, the loudest. Oh, you, no, you don't get to say hello. I don't know. I think my big mouth will speak plenty as we get going. I'm cut off from the same cloth. So if you know her, you, you know me. <laughs> that sounds about right. All right, and then we have coming up last would be Nathan Berry. Yo, yo, yo. If you ever wanted to know what I looked like as a man or black, that would be Nathan. Again, we get on famously. He's my prophet. He's at my back 24-7. He he is uh, my armor bearer. We are busy writing a book together. He's in the office with me every day. He's the one that keeps the team together. We like to refer to him as the big brother of the Next Gen Prophets team. He and Chai are the big brother and sister and kind of keep the chaos down to a minimum and sometimes start start the chaos. chaos. You you get to say hello. Hello, everyone. How's it going? 
Uh, just thank you guys for having us. Thank you so much. Uh, we really, really appreciate all the hospitality that you guys have shown. Uh, we feel at home. We're with our family. And we just want to know that. Uh, guys, I mean, I just want to say this one thing. Guys, get ready, because we're going to have some fun with you right now. Absolutely. <laughs> We hope that we get to display for you the different heart of the fivefold ministry. Because as you can see, we're all very fiery. Um, we all flow in all the gifts. We all can function in all the body ministries. So what makes us all different? And we're all from Africa. Yeah, oh, absolutely. In one way or another. Yes, we certainly are. <laughs> what makes us different is the heart that we walk out in our callings. Amen. So let's quickly jump back to Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. And I gave you guys five functions this morning. And so for those of you who missed this morning's message, you get to see it displayed and to understand it at a new level. Ephesians 4, 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith. And the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man. And finally, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Together, we are called to equip the, the body of Christ to become full in Christ. And we start with the first one. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And if you don't get that you have a separate grace than your brother or sister next to you, you are going to fight. Because how Jessica, who's a teacher, would equip someone to do the work of the ministry. And Nate, who's a prophet, who would do the work of the ministry are two very, very different ways. Why don't you explain? As a teacher, when it comes to equipping the body, I lay a foundation in the lives of those I work with. I don't just teach them a good principle. I go to the core of their DNA and help instruct and build a foundation in them that doesn't just affect them, but will affect the generations after them. A prophet can come with a word, but as a teacher, my job is not done in just one setting. It's not done in just two settings or over a sermon. The work that I do to help equip and to help instruct the body of Christ is a continual renewing of the mind, refreshing, instructing, building a foundation that will leave an inheritance for many generations that will reap from that foundation. And for the prophets, <laughs> it's wrapped up in face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church and the chief cornerstone of our hearts. Now, to kind of maybe try to give you a good picture of this, I want to tell you a funny story. I bet it wasn't so funny, actually. But anyways, so I grew up in the church. I'm a pastor's kid. And I was at church once, uh, one Wednesday at a Bible study. Here we are at this Bible study, and we're talking about the topic of healing and it started to get a, a bit dicey because, well, we were talking about how my grandfather had passed away from a disease. And it was like, well, if it's God's will, I mean, this was God's will. You know, God came and he took him home to be with him kind of idea. One of those things, you know how it goes. Oh, they're off to a better place and God's got them now. And the prophet in me just couldn't stay quiet. I was trying to, though. I really, you know what? I tried my best. I closed my mouth, my big fat prophet mouth. I zipped it with the zip tie shut. But one deacon or elder in the church had to do it to me. I would like to know what you have to say about this. Brother, you called on the person that likes to rock the boat. Because that's what we do as prophets. And I'm like, okay, all right, Lord Jesus, how do I say this gracefully? And I just said, you know what? I don't believe that Jesus called my grandfather home. 
I believe that the devil had his part to play. And I believe that this sickness was not from the Lord. And I believe that because I went to Jesus and I asked him because I have a relationship with him. And I said, Lord Jesus, what's wrong? What's happening? And he let me know it was not my plan and it was not my will. But sometimes we just, we don't have all the, we don't know how to use all the weapons we have in the body of Christ. And it's like going to war in real life. Sometimes you lose some soldiers out there. And sometimes we lose soldiers in the body of Christ. But we don't have to blame Jesus for the loss of our soldiers. We don't have to blame Jesus because we weren't very equipped with using our weaponry and we lost that battle. But we can get equipped to win the next battle. And that is the heart of the prophet. We want, I, I don't want you to believe that it was Jesus' will. Because if you do, then you're going to miss the next battle too. Because if you do, I can't equip you to be a conqueror on the next one. And so it's like, ah, uh, it burns in me to say, no, I can't be quiet. Saying, telling me the nature of Jesus is to kill when I know he's the bringer of life. It's like speaking heresy and upsetting a teacher. Don't you do it. I'll take you out at the knees. <laughs> Jesus is my spouse. Which one of you will let someone speak badly of your spouse? What kind of spouse would you be? Amen. Now, Pastor, how would you have handled that situation? That exact same situation, if that had come up. How would you have handled it? You know, as a pastor, I see it from both sides. And it's like I look at the heart of the matter. It's like we do need to have those equipped. We do need to know that they need to know that Jesus is the good shepherd. But a good shepherd has a staff that yanks the sheep from falling over the, the edge of the cliff. But you know, he also sees the hurt and the broken. And he says, my good and faithful sheep, come alongside me. Let me come, come sit on my, on my lap and let me feed you. <laughs> let me heal you. And let me send you out so that you can actually be the sheep you're called to be. We have to respect the different grace that God has given us. And you, Mike, how would you have handled that? <laughs> that would have been a very different situation. Because as an evangelist, guys, I love fire. Come on. Somebody give me a hallelujah. <laughs> I love fire. I'm a fire starter. We bring conviction in that moment, when you're in the trenches with somebody, you're digging that hole, you're shoveling the sand. That is what you want. And while the pastor's there in the medic bank, and he's over there taking care, I'm going, keep digging, boys. We got this one. Keep digging. We're going to go deeper. We're going to get that conviction whether you like it or not. That's the way it's going to be. And the apostle's standing there and saying, okay. This is, this is what we need to do here. We need some healing because they just lost a family member, prophet. Okay, evangelist, you want to just go cast the demons out of everybody. But in the meantime, this woman just lost her husband, so they need a little bit of healing. But clearly the doctrine in the church is a little bit out of order. So while the person who lost the loved one is in the medic bay getting some healing, what we're going to do is I'm going to bring the teacher in. And we're going to say, let's look at this again together. Mm -hmm. And she's going to look to the prophet and say, prophet, what do you see? Mm -hmm. And you're going to say this. And the prophet's going to look and see. I can see that this is a doctrine that's been preached in the church for a long time. And this one thread is leading us astray. And the evangelist is going to say, and it's demonic. And there's the demon standing right at the back of the church. <laughs> so I'm like, good. Prophet, you're going to do warfare. You're going to cast the demon out. You're going to teach the people someone new, something new, and you're going to heal the ones that are broken. <laughs> Together, we just equip the body of Christ in our own graces. It is in incredibly powerful when we can respect what God has given us. No anointing is greater than the other, but together we do a complete work. You see... We can't all cast out the demons because we know, like you said, the demons are there because of the hurt. Yeah. Who's going to take time to heal? 
And even then, when somebody comes to you, there is so much hurt. We need the prophet to pinpoint the one hurt we need to address now. When you get somebody coming to you like that, there is so much hurt. And as a teacher, you can get overwhelmed because you see all the hurt. But the prophet can be the spotlight. The evangelist, he's mostly seeing the demon. He, do, he doesn't even see or feel the hurt underneath it until he casts the demon out and then boom. Suddenly there's, there's hurt there as well that he needs to go deeper on. But now as a prophet, you're not going to be casting all those demons out. You just, do they know Jesus? Jesus will fix everything. They just, need, they just need Jesus. If they have Jesus, they will let go of the demon. If they have Jesus, that, that they'll get the teaching. Jesus will teach them. Jesus will teach them everything. Church of prophets, they become heretics. It's just true because it's just Jesus is enough. We don't, we don't need the word. We just go on what we see in the spirit. But yet together, when we become professionals in our singular grace, God can do something with us. Number two, all five of us are meant to edify the body of Christ till we have the same DNA, till we're in unity of faith, until we have the same conviction and all think the same way. Now, as the apostle, this is what I spearhead. God sent Moses up to the mountaintop to get the pattern. You cannot begin to bring the body into unity of faith if you don't know what you believe. Mm. What is the blueprint? What is the pattern? How do we know where we should be going in the first place? There's a lot of people that just stumble into it. You know, there's a lot of people going around the wilderness for 40 years. That happened after Moses went up the mountain. We need to go up the mountain first before we can become a nation. And it takes time for that leader to be processed as Moses was processed to go up to the mountain and to come back again and again and again. He he went up way more than one time. He went up several times to get the pattern. And each time he brought another piece down. But you know what he was doing? He was creating a culture. He was creating a family DNA amongst the children of Israel. For when he brought that law and that pattern down, tell me, who was it that implemented that pattern? It wasn't Moses. Aaron, Miriam, the elders, all of these took that pattern and taught the people and built the tabernacle and did the work. Again, God is resurrecting this pattern in the New Testament church. Do we have our pattern and can we stop feeling that we need to copy everybody else's pattern? No, Moses, go up the mountain and be bold in your pattern. So yes, there are many things that we could do, many convictions that we could have. But as the apostle, I go before the Lord and say, okay, what of your DNA do you want for us? What is the one focus that you have for us? There are many things I could be. There are many roads that I've walked But what is yours? And I come down and I say this. This is the core of who we are. This is what I believe needs to be our unity of faith. And I bring it down to the team. And I say, teacher, begin to teach. When it comes into unity, how can the body be unified if we do not even believe the same thing? The word talks a lot about how fights and quarrels break up among us. And if you want to see the enemy at the center of your home, look for where there's disunity. Look for where there's chaos, where one believes another and one believes something else. When someone believes the sky is blue and another one believes it's pink, you can bet there's going to be a fight of who believes it's right. But it all is a matter of opinion. It's a matter of perspective. Did they come during sunset? Or did they come in the middle of the day? Because are they both right or are they both wrong? It's hard to say because when one person is only trying to force their one opinion, their one perspective, we have fights and quarrels. When each of us take a doctrine, have a perspective, have our experience in Christ and only harp on that one experience and don't come together in unity, we have conflict of interest and Christ cannot be at the center of us. God the Father is there where two or three are gathered. And I don't mean just standing next to each other. Are you in the same mind? 
Are you thinking the same? Are you unified in your likes? Are you unified in spirit? Because where you are unified in believing the same thing, in standing in the same structure, their Christ will be at the center. Their Christ can direct your thoughts. Their Christ can direct where you go. But if you don't even believe in the same thing, if a church, half the church doesn't believe in the fivefold ministry and the other half does, your foundation will fall and you will stumble because then Christ is not at the center of that church. There is disarray, there is chaos, and there is a need for the fivefold ministry to come and do some casting out and some sorting. But you need, before anything else can begin to be structured, before anything else can be built to the rest of the body of Christ, a foundation of peace needs to be established through the wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. And that takes time. Because how many times do you have to teach someone before it becomes a conviction? Until they believe it was their idea, pretty much. (laughs) Brilliantly said, that is the job, the heart, and the travail of the teacher. To teach until the person believes it's their idea. And that is why they're probably the most long-suffering, I think, out of all of the fivefold ministry. Because theirs is not one big burst of fire, but a trickle. Again, they're like a coal in the fireplace that is always lit. That has to continue to make sure that all the other logs get set on fire. Uh, Who do I ask next? Mike, how do you edify the body of Christ to bring us all to have the same conviction? Yeah, perfect. Oh, it's such a good point, Apostle Colette. The one thing that is very different to the contrast of the teacher and to myself as an evangelist is this. As an evangelist, you know, we want to get in there and get the job done. We're not one of those timely people with long suffering. I must be honest. I'm a very impatient person. Let's get in there, get the job done. But when you train up and edify the body of Christ, you need to, as an evangelist, you need to actually take the time to do so. You can't rush into it and just cast out demons in this allegory that we used in the beginning. You have to come to a place saying, look, I can pick up the external anointing that you are You have this dim demon, and it's manifesting, it's going crazy. But my focus right now is not on the demon. My focus is on all of you. It's not just the one manifestation that the enemy is coming to bring this distraction. It's what is the Holy Spirit bringing for all of the body, not just the one person. Very, very good. You see, now that's something that we don't realize a lot of the time is that the church needs evangelists as much as the lost do because we need that fire in the church. And you know what I love is that when I come with a pattern and I'm saying, okay, guys, this is the DNA. This is what we need. Actually, the next in the fivefold I need is the evangelist. I need a fire bringer. Why do I need a fire bringer? Because we're in complacency. When you're bringing something new, nobody likes new, nobody likes change. So you know what we need? Conviction of sin, conviction of complacency, conviction of our rut. So we're going to send the fire bringer to shake everybody up until their hearts are open enough to begin to receive. How would you encourage and motivate the body of Christ to get them to think the same way? (laughs) You know, first of all, I want to say, you know, as a pastor... It's so good to have the apostle lay that foundation because, and the teacher come in with the, the doctrine to lay it down because my care is for the sheep. And sometimes the burden comes on you to try and find a pattern, to try and lay down a law. But you know something? I don't have it. I can get it if I have to, but my care of my sheep is more important. You know, David had to go and fight the lion and the bear. And, but you know what? His main concern was the sheep looking after them. And that's the thing. is like if I can bring unity within, if I look at the needs of my sheep, I know how to minister to them. I know how I can be the best shepherd to them. You see, they lay this all down. And I'm looking going, okay, we're about to go on a trip. It's like the mom. You you ladies will probably know this very well. Right, we're going on a trip. We need the wet wipes for the baby because Johnny's definitely going to find something to get sticky and to mess himself up. Susie's going to probably be putting something in her hair. Uh, Billy Bob's going to probably throw his shoe out the window, so I better have an extra pair. Uh, John, uh, you know, William's always hungry, so I better have a snack handy at any time. (laughs) 
And this is the way it is. We, as the shepherds, we, as the pastors, are looking, going, okay, these are all the things that are going to come up. These are all the needs that the, my sheep are going to have. What can I do to make sure when that need comes up, I've got an answer. I've got what they need to continue. When, the, when, the, when the, the, the doctrine starts to shake them up a little bit, do I have the ointment to minister to them, to help them to get through that little hiccup so that they can get back on track? <laughs> so beautifully said. Do you see the different perspective? Same vision, same point, very different perspective. You see, I really don't care about Johnny's shoe. <laughs> Just get him in the car. We're on our journey. God has got, the, I've got the GPS coordinates. We're heading to this destination. Everybody on board, this is where we're going. Pastor, you better make sure you got that extra pair of shoes because it's a you problem. You see, but on the other hand, he doesn't need to worry about the destination. The pastor doesn't need to worry about the pattern because it's not his grace. And he doesn't need to freak out about it. He, he can just take care of the needs of the people. I want you to break free of the guilt of not having it all. For those of you who are not pastors, it's okay. And for those of you who are, it's okay that you don't have the pattern. It's okay that you don't have the fire. You don't have to. It's not your grace. You just do what God has given you to do. For the prophet, I'm just hoping that Johnny got in the car and didn't get left at home. <laughs> it is in the heart of the prophet to look for the bruised and the broken and the rejected <laughs> because you've gone through and you face so much rejection yourself it your process shapes you and gives you eyes to see the wounded the broken the rejected the overlooked the outcasts you have eyes to see the outcast so how I want to bring unity to the body of Christ the first thing I want to do is I want there to be a corporate anointing Jesus let there please be a corporate anointing. Please don't let everybody be doing their own thing. Please don't let this part of the church be over there, this part be over there, and this part be over there. Don't let these guys be on vacation while these guys are cooking. Can we just all be just together? Can we just have one focus? Can we not have five focuses at the same time? Can we have unity in amongst the crowd? And yes, sometimes within all those focuses, there can still be unity. But I'm just saying this to make this point that in the heart of a prophet, you will see this. I'm going to give you the raw, unfiltered version, not the mature prophet version, because you will see a lot of unfiltered prophets in the church, and you need to know what they look like. They will come, and they will be the one sounding like, oh, I'm so frustrated. They, just, they don't let the Spirit of God move. I'm so frustrated. They're always being a hindrance to the anointing. The power of God, I, I, I want to see it here right now, but I don't see it. And they're getting frustrated. And what's really happening is they're not so angry with you as much as they're frustrated at the circumstances. They have eyes to see something and they don't know how to deal with it yet. And as a prophet, we have eyes to see disarray sometimes. We have eyes to see disunity in the church. Mm -hmm. And we just don't realize that God gave us that because he wants us to do something about it. He wants us to work at bringing unity amongst everyone. So uh, a kind of an example of a prophet bringing unity. I want to use Jared when we were doing laser tag a couple nights ago. And it's amazing watching a prophet in any environment, at the workplace, on the social environment, anywhere. And we're all running around, and he's like, you're doing great. Oh, th maybe this person just got shot, and they got to go back to base. They lost all their points. Awesome job. Keep it up. You got this. It's like, even, I'm just going to say this word, even when you're a loser, the prophet doesn't see the loser in you because they see the heart in you. They see the warrior inside. They always see what God is shaping. And so, yes, how we want to bring unity to the body of Christ is we pull out the potential in you. And the teacher really sees the loser. <laughs> Just like that. No point. If there are no points on the scoreboard, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You would think that it's the, uh, the prophet that has the sharper sword, but you would be very wrong. It's actually the teacher that has the sharper sword. Yeah, there are no points on the board. You're like, really suck. <laughs> you do. Let me teach you how to play. Because clearly, you do not know what you're doing. 
But the prophet's like, look, I know we all got to start somewhere. We got to start somewhere. Come on, you and me, you know, let's play together next time. Maybe then we'll get a few more points. And she's like, I'm not playing with you until you learn to play. And as an apostle, I'm like, all right, guys, let's respect one another's grace here. Let us see how we can put it together. Let's have the pastor help this poor guy out, you know, get his, his armor on. And uh, you can teach him how to play better, and then you can go out into the battlefield, and you can go ahead of the way and make sure he doesn't get tripped up, okay? Powerful team when we respect one another's grace. The next point is my most favorite, actually, and that's we as the fivefold ministry are meant to bring a knowledge of the Son of God. Now, remember in the first meeting, I labored quite um, extensively on how our relationship with the Lord is really the core of our calling. We express our calling through the relationship we have with Him. Now, the apostle, what is quite different because the Lord, because we teach on the fivefold ministry, the Lord had me visit each of the fivefold to get enough of an understanding of it, at least to be able to teach. And what was fascinating when the Lord transitioned me to the apostolic is that I was very much like Nate. It's all about Jesus. Like, put me and Jesus in a room, four walls, I'm fine. He just love on you, and you just feel so good about yourself, and you're so healed and so good. And I'll never forget one day I was in my secret place with Jesus. We had this beautiful little shelter behind a waterfall. I'd spent hours there. And one day he said to me, come. Come, Khalid, it's time to go. So I'm like, oh, we're going on a journey. He said, yeah. And he opened the veil and he led me out of the secret place and he took me to the throne room. And he put me in front of the Father and then he turned and left. And he shut the door to the secret place. And I'm like, what you doing? He said, it's time for you to transition now. It's time for you to, to understand me in a different way. And for the first time, I came to understand the power of the Father And that is why when the Lord begins raising up an apostle to go up that mountain, to get that pattern, his relationship with the Lord will begin to shift. And it was very confusing for me because Jesus, I love how you said, it's much like the mom, you know, nurturing, you've got this, I love you. Oh, did you get a boo-boo on your knee? I got you, it's okay, you're still beautiful. The father's like, you're a mess. You're a mess. Clean yourself up. Stand. Stand and be accountable. My people are dying for lack of knowledge. Why are you running from me? Why did you not obey my instruction, Moses? You know, that presence of the Father is the authority that you sense in an apostle. Because the weight of the church is on you. And the father is not messing with his bride. He's not messing with the church. And he wants structure and he wants order and he wants obedience. And until the apostles prepared to walk in that obedience, he does not qualify to be able to put that pattern together to piece everybody else together. A greater level of accountability is called to. He is the Father. He is the disciplinarian. He is a righteous, omnipotent God. And you should fear Him. That is the God I know. That is the God I know. That is the God I stand in. But I'm an apostle. I have to stand in that authority. I have to stand in that accountability. Otherwise, I let God's people down. It has to be God's way or no way. There's no shades of gray. If God said go, you go. You know, it was very shocking for me because when Jesus corrects, he does it in such a nice way. He almost hints, really. He's like, my sweetheart, you know I don't like it when you do that. You know what breaks my heart. You're like, Jesus, I'm so sorry, Jesus. You know, he, he just needs to, to give you the slight hint of, ah, that wasn't really what I had in mind. And you're just like, you're done, you know. I, the Father, the Father is not that guy. <laughs> the relationship that I learned with the Father was one of the ground shakes. The ground shakes and you walk in fear and trembling. Because when you, as an apostle, misstep, the lives of God's people are at stake. You don't set up a whole spiritual DNA based on your own flesh and think you're going to glorify God, apostle. You don't set up a DNA and a structure because it feels good to you and think that you're going to bless God's people and your father will be proud of you. He will not. 
We walk in obedience. And I felt that weight come on me. And it was, it was a, a shocking shift. But if that's all you know, then you're going to break God's people too. That's why we need the fivefold ministry. Let's start with the prophet this time. How are you going to bring people into a knowledge of the Father, of the Lord? What's your relationship with the Lord? My relationship is bride and bridegroom. Jesus is the lover of my soul as a prophet. I come to a, an intimacy like she was talking about of the secret place. He, he brings me into the secret place and he removes all the veils that blocked me from being able to. It's like I see this picture of the, the wedding day and the woman is coming down the aisle with a veil over her face. And then she gets to her groom and at the end, right before they kiss, he lifts the veil. And that is the depiction of the relationship a prophet has with the Lord Jesus. He removes the veil. He removes the veil that has hindered you for so long from seeing him face to face, from being able to feel him, from being able to experience him, because many of us know him, but not many of us experience his arms wrapped around you like a blanket in the middle of a hard time of your life. He sits right beside me when I drive in the car, and he speaks to me just like my wife would speak to me. He speaks to me just like my friends would speak to me. I can be in the grocery store. I can be walking down the street. I can go anywhere in this life, and Jesus is as real to me as anybody in this room. And he makes sure of it. I don't even have to work hard to see Jesus. He works hard to make sure I see him. He removes the veil, not me. The groom does that part. He lifts the veil. That is how I come to a knowledge of the Son of God. He comes and he removes the shame. He removes the guilt. He removes all the, the fears that I've got. Anything that's blocking me. I, I can't look at you because I, I got this sin in my life. I can't look at you because I remember how I treated that person years ago. And he removes all the shame. He removes all the guilt. And he stares me in the face and he says, I love you. You are mine and I am yours. Hmm. As an evangelist, the one relationship that I have the most with the Lord is through the Holy Spirit. He is my best friend guide. And I mean that in the most sincere way. Because for those of you that have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, he's a tough guy. He, you can't get off that structure like the apostle laid down. You have to follow the pattern. As much as we want to get off and derail, we can't. Because the Holy Spirit's right there. Michael, uh-uh, not today. And I'm like, but I'm right here. That external fire comes through the Holy Spirit. My relationship grew through the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus comes to me and says, well done, my good and faithful servant, I'm in awe and I bow. It is because of my relationship with my big brother, the Holy Spirit, that I can do that, that I can stand, that I can go through the fire. I can go through the trials and the tribulations. No matter the situations, it is for that reason that we ignite the fire in the church. That is my relationship with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. As a teacher, you know God the Father is the steady rock, the foundation on which you trust. You know him as a God that has no shadow of turning. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his opinion. He's not moved by feeling. He's moved by his presence, by sin and by righteousness. The Holy Spirit will come and he'll influence your feelings. The prophet will experience Jesus and sway your feelings. As a teacher, there's no feelings. 
No, there's none of this. I feel the Holy Spirit. I feel that spirit. No, you just get convicted. You don't feel no spirit of conviction. You just are convicted. <laughs> he's here or he's not. He's not kind of here. His presence is not kind of there. You don't kind of know him. You know him or you don't. And as a teacher, you can only build and trust that which the Holy Spirit has taught you and that you know that he's proven to you through the fire. When he's proven his love for me, I know his love. When God has shown and proven it through the word, through circumstances, and is instilled in, him, in my heart, I know how to teach others how to experience his love and how to know his love. Because it's not good enough to feel his love. If I don't know his love, I don't know what it looks like, I don't know what it's going to do, then what's the point of just feeling it? I can feel many things. I can feel hungry. If I don't know what to do with that hunger, what am I supposed to do with it? If I don't know hungry means to go eat something, what's the point of just being hungry? you got to actually know what that feeling means. What is that feeling drawing you towards? Because once you know, you can then take action, and then it can begin to build a pattern and begin to establish a relationship that can be trusted, that no matter how you feel, no matter how you think, because you know, no matter what happens, you'll know he's with you. I think you guys followed up perfectly for each other. <laughs> for the pastor, I want to take you back to a memory. Think back on your earliest memory as a child. Lying on the chest of your parents and hearing that all too familiar sound. Thud, thud. Thud, thud. Thud, thud. For me as a pastor... I want to hear the heart of the Lord. Because if I hear the heart of the Lord, I know he's close by. And then what I want to do is I want to take that heart and I want to make sure that every one of my little sheepies feels that heart too. Because I know when you're out in the cold, I know when that pain in your heart is so intense, if I can just hear that heartbeat, I know that you're going to get the strength it's going to give you the ability to push through those troubled times. When you lose a, a family member, when you see somebody sick, when you see something and you feel all alone, just that heartbeat alone is going to give you the courage to push through. When you can't take another step and you hear that footstep, that heartbeat, I mean, it gives you the, the courage to walk that extra mile needed to get to the finish line. Hmm. Do you even know what it's like to put a teacher and a prophet in a counseling session? <laughs> we finally learned to balance it. But Nate's like, you need to feel conviction. You need, Mike's like, you need to get a conviction. You need to feel it. Jess is like, just get it. Conviction's not a feeling, it's a choice. You don't need to feel nothing, you just need to know. And they're like, do you feel it? She's like, you don't need to feel it. Just know, just stand on the word of God. You don't need to feel faith. You don't need to feel love. You need to feel something. God said it, we do it, and that's how it's going to be. And they're like, but they need to feel the flow of the Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh, love. See, that's why you need the apostle. Like, okay, let's put you each in place. Both of you the are referee, needed. Right? But it would help for them to know if they felt a little something first. You know, can we at least bring them into the presence of Jesus first? Let's get rid of their shackles and their, you know, bring some fire. Then, then let's heal them with that gentle breeze of Jesus, you know. And then you can tell them what they need to know. They're not ready for your sword yet, teacher. Chill out. You know, just, she just walks around. Oh, just cut that off. You don't need that ear. Uh-uh. Cut that ear off of the, and the poor, poor, poor prophet's like, but, but, but. Yeah. We must respect our differences and boast in them. And for those of you that have one of these callings, would you focus on it a little bit? It's powerful when it's pure. Our fourth function as a fivefold ministry is to grow up God's people. Now, for an apostle, my ultimate, and, and what I want to drive home is this. I need to be disappointed. I need to be this focused in what I am called 
to do. You see, I am well aware that sometimes when I bring that pattern and the righteousness and the fear of the Father, that it's very intense. I am aware of that. But you see, because I work with the fivefold ministry team, it's okay. I know that my amazing husband will say, well, she didn't mean it quite like that. Let me, let me help you understand. <laughs> and he needs to be all that. But you know, for the longest time, we had a lot of fighting because I'm like, you're just too nice all the time. They just need the truth. They need to know that they need to walk in righteousness. They, you obey God or you don't obey God. They're like, yeah, but sometimes they need some explaining and some nurturing through the process. When we both discovered that we were good at what we did individually, we could recognize that and come to peace and stop fighting and bickering about it. Now, when it comes to growing people up, my entire focus, it feel, I, I, I go to bed with it at night, I wake up with it in the morning, it follows me everywhere, is what is the structure? Can we please put the structure together? You can't grow up if you don't have boundaries. Even a child is a successful child if they know what the rules are. What are the rules? What is the structure? What is the DNA? What should they be doing next? You don't just raise a child by random. What time is dinner? What time is school? How should they make their beds? How should they relate to their siblings? What is the structure? I am very focused not on how they feel or how they think, but how they walk and the environment that they're in. And my job is to make sure that that environment is built. Much like Moses that got the pattern for the tabernacle, he brought the pattern down and everybody else built it. But until he did that, they didn't have a place to worship. You know, crazy, Moses didn't even go into the Holy of Holies. Aaron did. He didn't even get in there. He didn't even get to be as connected with the people within that tabernacle. Aaron and the priests did. But it was for Moses to create that environment for the glory to come down. Once I've done that, once I've brought the pattern and the fivefold ministry creates that environment, my job is done. For me, that's ultimate success, regardless of how you feel, regardless of how you think. And I have to be that way. And it took me a long time to be okay with that because I did work through some of the others. But because they have the heart, the fire and the passion, I can be that. And I could shake off that, that sense of, oh, I've got to be, you know, a little bit of everything. I've got to be more understanding. No, I don't. Because the minute I start doing that, I'm going to lose pieces of the pattern. I'm going to compromise on pieces of the pattern to keep people happy. And then I disobey God. And that as, as an apostle, I'm like, that, that is a boundary I'm just not willing to cross. I'm just not willing to cross that boundary. I'll come and I'll say, guys, I love you. But if we do this, I disobey God. And it's just a boundary I won't cross. I'm sorry, that's my line. I'll, I'll sway on a couple of things, but that's not it. So when it comes to raising somebody mature, in my opinion and perspective, all they need is that structure and to have everything fully set in place so that they have an environment in which to flourish. Who wants to go next? What do they need? Sorry? What do they need to grow up? Oh, Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to take this from an evangelistic side of this conversation that Apostle Galette was talking about. When, she, when Apostle Galette will come and bring God the Father, and she will set that structure and tell us not to disobey God, as an evangelist, my relationship with God the Father is, yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. That's how it is. And when we work in the function of our grace, and we know that each person's grace is different. We can work together as a team to edify the rest of the body. So for me, when my apostle, Apostle Colette, will come to me and give me that pattern and that structure to help grow the others and fellow evangelists, we actually have to sit and listen. That is the worst thing you can tell an evangelist to do, to sit and listen. We don't do that. We want to run and just dive head first into the rocks but if we stop for a moment and we sit and listen and we go yes sir I receive I understand what you're saying we will grow together we will continue to grow it's not just a one-time thing it's the continual growth again and again and again my turn oh this could be dangerous <laughs> Okay, okay, before I talk about maturity, can I talk about 
Uh, before I talk about adulting and growing up, can I talk about being a child? All right. All right, so I want to give you a little bit of, I want to take you on a transition. So as a prophet, this is what it looks like when you're not adulting and you're not grown up. And this is in the workplace. One of my brothers, I'm telling on you if you're watching or listening to me. But so we're in the office and we have what we call, okay, we're like, we got to get metrics. We got to get numbers. We got to figure things out. Okay, there, at the end of this day, we need to have made this, much, made this amount of money. At the end of this day, we need to have uh, got this many sales or whatever. And one of the prophets, did you get that? Did you get your metrics today? No, but mm, I got to minister to God's people today. Uh, the truth is, I just had to, I was praying and my heart was stirred and I was feeling all these things for people. Now, <laughs> a prophet, because like I said, our heart, we want you to feel the heart of a matter. Uh, we are men after God's own heart. Uh, there's a scripture in 1 Samuel. Actually, I even had it in here, but there's this scripture. I love it. It says 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Um, and then he goes on to say that the Lord doesn't see those, the outer appearance, but he sees the heart, right? But I love how it says, do not look. What a lot of people don't realize is that a prophet is shaped on purpose not to look at the outer appearance. They are shaped by the hand of God to look at the heart of a matter. So when you put a prophet in the business situation and he tries to look at the heart of a matter, you got to say, all right, but now you got to grow up a little bit because the heart of the matter is not going to go to Safeway and pay $237.83 to take your groceries home. You can't walk up to that person at Safeway and say, but do you feel my heart for my family? I came to shop for them. Heart doesn't pay the bills. U.S. dollars pays them. <laughs> but that, that's what a prophet tries to do. They try to handle everything with their heart. But a prophet that has matured is one that's like the scripture that says, in the foundation of the church was built with the prophets and apostles with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. When a prophet is mature in their calling, they are ready to build at the side of an apostle. When that prophet is ready and that prophet is mature and how they mature everyone else is they say, all right, the, the apostle said that this is our structure. So I see that you are very good at this. Remember how I talked about that motivating that Jared did? He, he worked so hard at making sure everyone wasn't a loser to the point where he found every last person's strength. And he says, you could say as a prophet, you're good at this. You are terrible at that, but you are amazing at this. You switch, switch positions right there. You, if you go over there, we are going to take the end enemy out and we are going to win this race and we are going to build a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. This is how we're going to raise the kingdom of God. And that's how a prophet works in maturity with the apostle. Woo! <laughs> As a teacher, when it comes to maturing, the two scriptures come to mind. I don't have the reference on hand, but it says, when I thought, it, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child. But when I came an adult, I put away childish things. And another scripture says, but in the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a teacher, it is for you to renew the hearts and minds of God's people. What is in the heart of man? There's sin. There's pride. There's anger. There's hurt. There is a lot of false doctrine, accusation, fears that plague the heart of man that conform them to act in a specific way that is against the will of the Father, that is leading them out of the will and leading them into deception, leading them astray. And as a teacher, before you can even get them on the right path, before you can even get them to the place of speaking as an adult, speaking as a man, can you first deal with the child and the, and the heart? If you can take them and work through all of those iniquities of the heart, Work through all of those burdens, renewing, refreshing, teaching them the right way. Because a lot of the times, a child doesn't know right from wrong. How does a child know not to take another kid's toy? When you discipline them and tell them no. You can't have that. How do they know that to eat something like ants is bad? When you tell them no. When you discipline them. And then as they grow older, they begin to mature. And then are able to discern from themselves, hey, 
this is right, this is wrong. I shouldn't do this. And then they can begin to walk in maturity. But as a body of Christ, how can we walk in maturity when our hearts have not been matured, when we are not mature in our encounter with the Father, in who we are as vessels? A vessel that is not properly baked in the oven will crumble and will melt into a pile and lose all of the work that it's done. The prophets and evangelists can spend a lot of time bringing together all of the nutrients, bringing together the clay, shaping the clay with the hand of the Father. But if it's not baked in the oven, under pressure, under fire, that vessel will crack and it'll all be for nothing and you will revert right back. As a teacher, I want to make that change stick. I not only want to make sure that you are put in the position to mature in that fire, but I want to make sure that it lasts long enough for you to complete the mandate and purpose of your call. Mm. So good. So good. As a pastor, I get to bring it all together. I get the best job, actually. They might fight with me, but the apostle has set the goal we need to go to. The prophet, the evangelist, and the teacher have given me so many good tools to work with. I, as as the pastor, can look at this and go, you're still on mother's milk. So let's feed you until you're ready to go to the next level. You are actually mature. You're actually ready to go on to that T-bone steak that is uh, sitting there on the grill. And I can slowly but surely help them to grow into that maturity. I can actually be there to say, hey, you've been on mother's milk for a very long time. I think it's time you start upgrading. And through that, through what I have now received from the rest of my brothers in the fivefold, I can take all these things and use it to grow up and to build my sheep, to make them strong and capable of what this world is going to throw at them. (laughs) I hope that what you're picking up is the heart. We're giving you a lot of information, but what we're mostly wanting you to see is the passion and the heart. That is how you identify the fivefold ministry. As the Lord begins raising it up here and in the church, everywhere you go, Mm. stop looking just for the externals, Mm. as Nate said. Begin looking for the heart. Mm. The fifth point that we should all be fulfilling as a fivefold is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, when we are not just adult, but we're perfect. Now, I'm going to ask this one question. What do each of the fivefold ministry deem as perfection? Mm. I'll let you guys think about that. What do I deem, when I look at a Christian and I'm like, you are perfect. That's it. You've got it. You've got it all together. Mm. As an apostle, what am I looking for? I'm looking for someone that's a success in their ministry, a success in their marriage, a success in their family, and a success in the workplace. I'm looking for someone that knows how to flow in the gifts that they have, whether they're on the street or whether they're on this podium or whether they're at work. Somebody who is above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. Somebody that's a go-to person, that's a light in the darkness, that when they're walking up here or when they're walking out there, out that door, that they are the same person. That both the world and the church respect them. That they find favor with both God and man because they are success in every level of their lives. I have not done my job as an apostle if all they can do is perform in church and they go home and they're not a success there. I have failed God. I have failed God and I will continue to work and I will continue to set structures and I will continue to be on my face as Moses did on that mountaintop crying out for the next pattern because it's not good enough you were anointed on Sunday when your marriage is falling apart. It's not good enough that you know how to flow in the gifts of the Spirit but you can't feed your kids at home. It's not good enough, Father. It's not good enough for your people. It's not good enough for this nation. It's not, this is not kingdom. That's what I want to see the body of Christ look like. I want us to be a city on a hill in every room lit up. Mm. Mm. Who wants to go next? I'm going to jump in. The prophet's ready. Let's go. Come on. Let's fight for the mic. I'm fired up. You got to wait your turn now. Okay. <laughs> For, the for, a prophet. <laughs> for, for me as a prophet, oh, so I see perfection as a perfect love relationship with Jesus. And not just, 
It's not a little, little phony love relationship with Jesus. It's not surface level. We, there's got to be a little bit of depth. If, if I see a perfect, somebody has a perfect relationship with Jesus, you can show me your, you can show me the, the walk that you've taken. You can show me where you walk through the valley of the shadow of death together and you came out on the other side. You can show me that actually there was a time in your life when you didn't hear Jesus very well. You could tell me all the times when you got into deception, when you're like, I know this is the voice of God. And then you were humble enough to know that it wasn't the voice of God and to correct your ways. Mm, yes. That is somebody that has been perfected in their relationship with Jesus. You can't just tell me how you can hear God, but not tell me which voice isn't him. Because a prophet knows the difference between their own voice, the voice of the Lord, and the voice of the devil. They know all three. And they can sit there and listen to anybody give a word from God, and they can tell you exactly which part is which of those three. They can say, because I'm a mature prophet, and because I've been there already, and because I'm bold enough to say that I failed, and that I got into deception, and that I spoke some words that led people the wrong way, I can tell you for sure that's not the voice of my Savior. And I don't care if I upset you, I'm here to help you. And just like what Apostle Colette was saying about those moments where she's like, I failed as an apostle, I failed as a prophet. If you walk out of the church and you don't know how to discern between all three of those voices. My job as a prophet is incomplete. If not every last soul hears the voice of their savior for themselves. And they also know the difference between when the devil is speaking to them and when their own mind is just speaking. And some, some are like, oh, no, that wasn't the Lord, brother. That was the devil. No, that wasn't actually the devil either. That was just their own mind. That was just them wanting their way. But do you know the difference? You should. And for me as a prophet, that means you have been perfected in your relationship with Christ. Very good. Absolutely. <laughs> For me, my version would be very simple and very complex at the same time. I'm looking for those fire starters, the ones that can go out there and start other fires, can ignite those broken-hearted people in an audience, in a place where you can't even mention the name of Jesus. When they're waiting... And they're looking around broken. And you can walk over there and you can say, boom, that's it. That's you. Where I failed, like Apostle Nathan just said about the three, where I failed is that I don't ignite that flame that is inside of you by the time you leave that door, church. That is my goal. To bring deliverance to people who don't know my father who don't know the voice of Jesus, where we can lead them up the stairway, here, learn the three different ways. Next person, let's go. <laughs> we'll continue to break down the barriers. We'll continue to break down this evolution in the body of Christ that has been so dormant for ages now. That is what we're looking for. And that is what I am looking for in the body of Christ. Hmm. As a teacher, this was a real trick question. I felt like there was no yes or no answer to this because perfection is a matter of opinion and perspective. There is no perfect, there is just close to it. But as a teacher, I'll say this, what I'm looking for in a complete vessel, because you can get a complete vessel, but they're not always perfect, but you can get a complete vessel. What we look for and what I look for is someone who is not double-minded. Somebody who doesn't see and change opinion against that will believe the Lord for one moment, but then will deny him in another. Who will be convicted, but on the other hand still serve the enemy. You have only one master, and you choose who that master is. And if you have one foot in the world, and your mind is renewed by the world instead of renewed by Christ, then we have a conflict of interest. And there is a double-mindedness that means that you are immature in your faith. If you are not mature in your faith, and you are double-minded, you are not complete, and you will crack. So what I look for is someone who is mature in their faith, somebody who knows who they are, who knows their convictions, and is not swayed by the world and the opinions of it. Mm. To a certain extent, I think we've come full circle because, I mean, for me as a pastor, a mature person is one that has a heartbeat of the Father. If I hear the heartbeat in them, I know that they're mature. 
But it doesn't stop there. Because for me, a mature man imparts that heart to the sheep under him. Mm -hmm. When I see somebody taking the doctrine of the apostle, the teaching of the teacher, the conviction, the heart, combining it for themselves, making it their own doctrine, and then taking that doctrine and pouring it into those under them that the Lord has brought to their feet, I know that they have become mature. Because you know what? There's a heritage that is going to go out. This, this doctrine, this heart does just not go from my heart. It goes to this generation, to the next generation, to the next generation. For me, the heritage that is going to go to the generations is what counts. Because I know when that heartbeat is beating right, families are healed. When I know when that one family gets it right, that child will raise up a family that is going to be God conscious, that is going to change a nation. Because when we have whole families together where the mother and father do the job right, they give the child the right encouragement to be successful, to stand in the convictions of Jesus, to stand even in the shadow of death and say, my God says, I know that their children will pick that up and we will start to see a change where we will not have homeless families. We will not have missing moms and dads. We will not have people that never knew the love of a father and a mother. We will see change and we will see it rock this world. The early church put the known world on its ear because love was at the center of everything they did. And it's time that this world experiences it again. There's a new move coming, people. There's a new move coming. We, as the fivefold, want to see every single one rise up. But as the pastor, I want to see every single person in that place rising up the next generation and the generations to come. Absolutely beautiful. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Like I said this morning, it's not good enough to just lay a foundation. We've got to build a house. And we've got to put a roof on the house so that we can hand that house to the next generation for them to decorate and to add on to. Thank you all so much for coming along this incredible, fun journey with us. You're such an amazing group. Before we head out, thanks, Thomas. You are like, don't forget, I know you got my back. Um, we've got some flyers out there for those of you who feel that they do have a call. The Lord's stirring some things up. Um, I'm going to announce two things. For those of you, firstly, who have that same prophetic fire and you're like, oh, so I'm not crazy. I'm just like this weirdo over here. I may be a prophet, okay? I've, I'm, I've got a book giveaway. If you subscribe to my mailing list on toachministries.com, just go check it out. And the book is called, I'm Not Crazy, I'm a Prophet. It's not just the first few chapters. It's, it's not just a summarized version. I really do give the whole ebook away for free. It's also available for those who want to buy it on Amazon. But really, why go buy it? And go get books. it for free. Just go get it for free, touchministries.com. When you subscribe, you'll get the, the PDF. You can download it. And I pray that it confirms your call like it has done with thousands of others. And then for those of you who are bouncing around and not quite sure, go to the other side of that. It's got a nice little QR code. You can just snap a picture with your, your phone. and It'll take you to the site. It's apostolic-network.com. And, um, you know, when they first invited us, they said we should bring some of our books. But I got a lot of books, and I didn't know which one to pick. So we did something very special just for this group right here. We wrote you guys a five-fold ministry course, a free five-fold ministry course. We put it together on the system over here. You are the first ones that will have access to it. And what it is, is it's six lessons, one for each of the fivefold. There are video lessons with multiple choice questions. And the very last one is an evaluation where you get to, to fill out a form and, and discover your call. Once you've gone through it, if you have any questions, if you are not sure what's going on in your life, this is interactive. You will get a response from one of the team. The system that the course is on is like a, a private Facebook, if 
serve you well. You get to chat, you get to connect, you get to to post questions if you have them. We want to make sure you're equipped. You see, that's our DNA. That's what we do. So for those of you who are rising up in your call, please grab one of these flyers and we look forward to staying connected with you. Tom, can I hand back to you? Can I show your appreciation? So, so if you don't mind, just before I hand over to you, folks, it's been a privilege to be a part of this family. I really want to thank Tom, Katie, Angie, Gail. There's so many of you that have blessed us so much, um, you know, even from hosting. You know, all of you guys have blessed us so much. And I just want to thank you very much for just hosting us, bringing us here, and just allowing us to pour into you guys. You know, we don't do this for the glory. We do this because we want to pour into you guys. We want to pour our seeds. We want to pour our anointing into good soil. And you know something? We were able to do that. We fulfilled our calling is to pour into you guys, to pour the seeds into you that is going to flourish and make you the awesome men and women of God that God has called you to. And you know something? I don't care what your age is. You still got the fire. Thank you, brother. So just so you guys understand, if, you, if you're not quite sure which of your functions, which of your office uh, is, the, the QR code is, is, is going to lead you through by the end to help you understand kind of who you are, why you're operating the way you are, why you think through the lens that you think. Amen? So if you don't feel like you have clarity on that, that's what that's for. Um, them putting that together for us for free is just wonderful. And so we guys just show your appreciation, one, for just the teaching and just the instruction uh, and the service that they've already given. You guys are amazing. Yeah, come on. The, uh, on, on their website, you can find it on Amazon and any place uh, um, that books are sold. Um, they have over 40 books that uh, you can kind of go and something for, for everything. So uh, I, I just really appreciate you guys for your um, faithfulness, for your um, passion. That's what drew, drew me to, to, to um, share the, the stuff is because, um, as I've shared with uh, the church here, that in my, I don't, I don't, be careful how I, I, I speak, uh, in my, a prophet would call it desert season, okay, in my wilderness season, but for me it was an equipping season uh, for me to know who I was. In that season, the Lord, he said, I'm the lion from the tribe of Judah. I was like, I know. He says, well, I live in you. I said, I know. He says, why don't you let me out? And so... So I was trying to be very nice. As Romeo talks about it, right? Very nice. We like to be very, very nice. And the Lord said, I'm a lion. Let me out. And so um, I love that lion. That, it, that uh, you know, it's, 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 it's appropriate that you're from Africa, right? That lion that's inside of you. I, I appreciate it. It's a, a kindred spirit. It's a spirit that uh, causes my spirit kind of like Mary coming before her cousin and John the Baptist leaps before the presence of Jesus. It's a spirit upon spirit causing uh, us to be spurred on. And so it is our desire as a house and as a family is that in your time in this family, you know, family's all about maturing. Okay, so there's moms and dads, but if a child doesn't mature, pretty quickly mom and dad are going to take notice. So if you're four and you, you, you're just picking up on how to tie your shoe, it's like, okay, that's around the time. That's good. But if you're 13, we're like, okay, something's wrong. <laughs> They're not maturing. Maturing is lacking, okay? And so if you're in this family, you're a part of this family, we're going to be there to create an environment on a regular basis where we're where we can become family. So as I talked about the house churches, be, be aware as they begin to um, launch over in this next season 
um, that that's where family, just that put off all the fake, the mask, all that stuff of coming here and think you have to have it all together and that no one else understands your stuff and that you're the only one. No, you're not. Okay? <laughs> right? And I know that I'm the middle child of 11. I learned really quick. I'm like, yeah, we're nothing alike, but we got everything alike. Okay? And so I could put off, put down, and just be with the family. And I don't have to try to put on any kind of thing. I could just be family. And I could begin to possess that heart of just love for you because you, you trust me with you. You trust me with your heart. Okay? That's going to happen in the house churches. Um, and so really encourage you as that season comes to be a part of that. Um, but if you're a part of this family, we're going to continue to, to, to instruct you towards maturity. We're not really one of those houses that's just like, hey, come as you are and stay as you are. It's like, no, you can come as you are. But in this family, we're going to mature and we're going to progress to the full standard. And we're going to challenge you. We're going to challenge you. The shepherd will be there so that as you're being challenged, you feel safe. But we're going to challenge you, okay? We're going to challenge you towards full standard. So that when you stand before Jesus, it's a good day. That there isn't any part of you you're trying to hide. Amen. No, because you just like him. Amen. Because the family and the spirit and the fire, all of them work together. The word of God was working through the teacher. The, the, the fire of God through the evangelist. The spirit of God through the prophet. All of them were working together to purify you bright white for the coming of the bridegroom. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm excited. Who are you excited for tomorrow? For this, they're going to be leading again. So you guys excited for that? All right. Well, I want to give you this. Um, if we can get the the, the ministry to co- team to come forward, we want to pray. If you got anything, just as a family, we're here to minister. Um, and so, if you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray for you. For those of you who don't need uh, any any prayer, you're just like, I'm all good, man. I'm. I think I got what I came for. Um, praise God. Uh, I want to pray a blessing over you before we release you. But if I can get the ministry team, even the the Toach team, the family to come, and you can join with. And and so, if you need prayer for anything, we want to pray for you. Other than that, stand up. Want to pray a blessing over you as you go. Don't forget the table out there, the Fahees. Go ahead and connect with them before you leave. Other than that, lift up your hands. I want to pray a blessing. This is the prayer that Yahweh wrote himself. And you guys, I know you know it because I do it every week. But Yahweh, the only prayer in the entire scriptures that the Father wrote, said to the priest, you pray this over my people every single day. The only prayer. Okay? So I'm going to pray it because I'm, I'm commanded to pray it. But I want you to know, I want you to hear what's being said. He says, he says Father, keep them. It's a protection. So, Father, I ask that you protect your people. Protect them, Lord. Keep them. Protect them in their families. Protect their homes. Protect them, Lord. I ask this. And, Lord, I ask that you make your face shine upon them. This is the presence of God. The presence of God. God, may when they turn their hearts to pray towards you, may your face and your favor be towards them. I ask this, that you be gracious to them. Be gracious to them. Lead them by your spirit. Fill them with your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were blessed by this video, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.